Not many openings have a huge fan club. A group of do or die enthusiasts for whom playing this or that particular line is the be all and end all of chess. Yet the Black Mardi Magambit is one such opening. I suppose it's the thrill of giving up a pawn early in the game. The opportunity to blast out reams of home prepared analysis. The audacity to strut your funky stuff in the poor guy's face. Yeah, I suppose I can see the attraction now. And believe you and me, a lot of players want to do this. So join with me now on an idiosyncratic journey into the Black Mardima Gambit. We will find the Gambit tricky and eminently suited to funky stuff strutting albeit far removed from the aridity of world championship matches and the dour wood shifting so prevalent in the upper echelons of chess. As Grandmaster Julian Hodgson once dryly remarked, if you want to pay your mortgage or you've got hungry mouths to feed, then don't do it. But for all the rest of us, the Black Mar Demon Gambit opens up the door to enormous fun. The infamous Gambit is reached after the following moves. White plays d4, black d5, and now comes the gambit move e4. d takes e4, knight c3, and I'd like to break down what exactly I'm going to be looking at on this tape for you. The first part of the, the tape will deal with the gambit acceptance. That is, where black plays knight to f6, white plays f3, and black snaps the pawn off. E takes f3, knight takes f3. And obviously there are, there's a wide choice for black in this position. In the first section of the tape, we'll be looking at the move e6, a rather solid defence recommended by Max Erver. Then I'll go on to consider the move g6, which could be used against you by King's Indian or Grunfeld fanatics, where black elects to fianchetto the bishop on the king side. Against that, I recommend a very pointed attacking plan. I'll then go on to consider the move bishop to f5, which looks very solid. Black hopes to reinforce his position with e6 and develop in safety. Against that, I recommend a highly aggressive plan one which puts the question to Black's bishop as quickly as possible. We'll then go on to look at other setups for Black. For instance, Black may play the bishop out to g4 with the intention of exchanging bishop for knight, again trying to get a solid position. You will see that White can work up aggressive chances against that as well. Finally, I'll consider the move c6, one of those solid attempts again just to consolidate and hold the extra pawn. And we will see a wonderful game of Dutch international master Gerard Welling where he blows the black position away. In the second part of the tape I'll be looking at popular ways for black to actually decline the gambit, in other words to bottle out. I guess a lot of your opponents will feel that way when they see the black Mardima gambit ventured against them they'll feel very uncomfortable and they won't want to take the pawn. So what are the best ways for black to decline the gambit? Well, I'll be looking at the Vienna defence, bishop f5. Quite common, but I don't believe it's particularly good, and I'll show you why later on. I'll be looking at e3, which I reckon a lot of your opponents will play against you. They simply will not have the nerve to accept the gambit, and this looks safe. Anyhow, we'll see that this move doesn't interrupt White's development in any way and White can develop quickly and effectively against it. Finally, dropping back one move, I'll be looking at the move 3e5, the Lemberger defence, which I actually consider to be one of Black's best options at this point. We'll see that White can only obtain a minimal advantage against this move, but you can nevertheless play for the win with White even in the simplified positions that arise. In the final section of the video, I'll be looking at lines where black doesn't oblige with the move d5, and in fact goes knight f6. We can still get our black mar d gambit, but this time with the exchange of a pair of knights. 
for instance. If e4 in this position, then black can play knight takes e4. And this is a line known as the hoops gambit. Well, I'll show you that the exchange of knights need not favour the defending side and that with bishop c4, white can hope for the advantage. After one d4, your average Queen's Gambit declined Nimzo Indian or Queen's Indian player tends to be a fairly solid character. They will play slightly inferior positions for hours in the hope that you'll blunder from boredom. What they won't be ready for is a direct frontal attack against their king. This is where our white repertoire will really kick in. On the surface, White's setup is unassuming, but by the time Black realises it may well be too late to save himself. I will be presenting a complete repertoire for White after d4, d5, involving the Kali Zukatort system. Against the Nimzo Queen's Indian complex, I will be suggesting the classical system. For the unprepared opponent, White's setup could simply prove too hot to handle. So, we will be starting by looking at the Kali Zukert system, which starts after d4, black's main response will be d5, white plays knight f3, black plays knight f6, and white plays e2 to e3, introducing a Kali setup. Black's main response is e6. White plays bishop d3. And now Black, if he's to achieve any meaningful counterplay on White's centre, is at some stage, he may as well do it now, play the move c7 to c5. If he doesn't do it now, it's extremely likely he will do it in the near future. Now White plays the move b2 to b3. Black's last move contained a threat of c5 to c4, and this move stops the pawn moving to c4, but more than that, it prepares to fianchetto white's bishop on b2. With the bishop on b2, both bishops are taking aim at the black king side. White will be looking for opportunities to release the power of both bishops against the black king side with a perhaps d4 takes c5 at some stage. Hello everyone, International Master Andrew Martin here and welcome to this Foxy Openings DVD on Verisoft's opening. Now the Verisoft kicks off with the following moves. White plays d4, black plays knight f6, he could play d5. This will lead to the same position if white goes knight c3, d5 and now bishop g5. And this is the uh, characteristic position of the Verisoft. We can see already that by blocking his c-pawn, White is relying on peace play in the opening phase of the game. This makes Verisov a very aggressive opening. It also means that White's got to be thinking a little bit further down the line about how to develop his major pieces. In the Queen's Gambit, because it's very easy to get the White Queen out, uh, you often find that uh, White gets very comfortable play for his major pieces. He moves his Queen out easily to the Queen side, then he puts his Rooks in the middle. One of the major challenges for the Verisov player is how to develop the major pieces in the early middle game. And White usually does this via the pawn break e4. And it's this pawn break e4 that makes the game so different from the Queen's Gambit. The Verisov tends to lead to unorthodox positions. It leads to attacking positions. And it's an ideal surprise weapon. It can also be used by the average player with impunity. As usually you're going to find at lower levels, Black doesn't know what to do against this aggressive idea. I'm going to show you all Black's major defences on this DVD and we're going to, in this introductory section, look a little bit more at the themes of the Verisoft. And the first theme I want to highlight is that of unorthodox play. Now the first game comes from Amsterdam in 2010 and it's between two very strong grandmasters. Nigel Short playing White, who's willing to embrace any attacking idea available uh, in chess theory. And he's playing the young Dutch grandmaster Anish Giri who's probably a very strong theoretician. So Short thinks in this game, well, the Verisoft's the ideal weapon to play against this guy. 
what has he got to show against the Verisov? Well, Geary plays one of the standard moves here, knight bd7. And I guess this is an answer to White's question. Well, am I threatening bishop takes f6? Sometimes in the Verisov, it's good to take on f6, doubling the pawns along the lines of the Trompovsky. Sometimes not. At any rate, after knight bd7, Black takes this idea out of White's arsenal. So knight bd7 is just a good defensive move, which is directed against bishop takes f6. It really is as simple as that. And short plays, a very simple move here, pawn up to e3. Black plays e6, and now a very unorthodox move, queen to f3. So already short is setting his young opponent difficult problems in the opening. He's asking black to play a untheoretical position, and short is hoping to use his greater experience to outplay the young man in this rather strange situation. Just going back, white has other moves here. He can simply play bishop d3, he can move his knight out to f3. Queen f3 is just a very interesting and unusual idea. And black responds in the centre with c5. You're going to find a lot of your opponents playing in this way when you play the Verisov. And it's important to understand at this early stage that when you move your bishop out to g5, uh, the square b2 can often become weak. And the queen side in general perhaps needs a little bit of care. So with c5, black is thinking about bringing his queen out, either to b6 or to a5. Short is in the mood for an unorthodox game, a very provocative game here, and so he castles on the queen side. So seeing b2 protected by the white king, Geary just decides not to bring his queen out for the time being, and instead to prepare queenside pawn storm with a6. Knight g e2. It would have perhaps seemed more natural to bring the bishop on f1 out, but if we just take play back, where's that bishop going to come to? If he comes to d3, black could well play c4 and then b5 with a queenside pawn storm. So knight g e2 makes sense, and short will reveal his idea in the coming moves as black thematically brings the queen out to attack the white queenside, and white continues with forcing play. Bishop takes f6, knight takes f6, and now pawn up to g4. So white is now thinking about attacking that knight with g5. He's not wasting any time because he can see black is, well, already in a position to attack him on the queen side. So speed is the order of the day. And the bishop on f1 could well come out to g2 or h3 as the game progresses. Well, hello everyone and welcome to this uh, DVD where I'm going to be recommending Queen's Pawn Systems for White based around the moves, the initial moves, d4 and then e3 which doesn't sound too dynamic from White's perspective, but I think you're going to be in for a few surprises. As, for instance, systems like the Collie Zuckertort, the Stonewall Attack, a special system against the King's Indian setups, you're going to see that actually White can creep up on Black using this system and often get vicious attacking chances together. So we're going to be considering a whole bunch of systems, and the first one I'm going to look at is the Stonewall Setup, where white plays his bishop out to d3, black plays as though he's defending a queen's gambit, and then white can plough on with knight d2 and then f4. Now there are probably better ways for black to defend the position than this. The stone wall is particularly effective against systems where black plays an early e6, but black can also play, for instance, a fluid move like bishop f5, or he may play the trendy Slav set up using c6. Again, I'm going to show you ways to, to meet these ideas. Just going back to d4, obviously knight f6 is an important move. And when black delays the move d5, the position takes on a new contour. And therefore, against e6 and setups with b6, or setups at least where black doesn't play d5, I'm going to recommend that white goes back into the Collie Zuckertort system with e3, bishop d3, and b3. This is a nice fluid way to play, and white can often get an improved stone wall a little bit later on by playing knight e5 and f4. There are certainly some interesting possibilities for white using this system, and white is thinking aggressively. He's pointing both his bishops at the black king side. As you've seen, usually we're putting our bishop on uh, d3, but against systems where black plays an early g6, White has to switch play once again. And here I'm going to be recommending a special system, 
treating this like a reverse French defence, where White goes with a quick c4 and then advances on the queen side as quickly as he can. He might even delay the entry of his queen side pieces, the knight and the bishop, into the game in favour of a quick pawn push on the left hand side of the board. I'll also be showing you what to do if black plays Grunfeld setups with d5. So all in all, the systems I'm going to be showing are very rarely played. They're not catalogued in the book. This is most unusual. And they should give you an advantage over most of your opponents. In that people dismiss a move like e3 as too passive without actually giving it careful enough consideration. Black plays like that all the time. Well, white can play in the same restrained manner. And an added bonus of these systems, of course, is that white's position is rock solid. You can afford a few small imprecisions when you play like this with white because your position is, is so watertight. So all in all, interesting stuff. And I look forward to the material which I'm going to present to you now. Well, my first game is a, an almost ideal one from our perspective because it gives a flavour of the type of kingside attack that white can build using the outwardly modest stonewall formation. And it comes from the Cubans' woman championship in 2002 between Zirka Frometa Castillo and Yorile Uloa. And the opening, as I say, is very unpretentious. White just plays e3 and then puts the bishop on d3. This is quite a good square for the bishop, as you can see, monitoring the b1 to h7 diagonal. And black just responds classically here in Queen's Gambit style by playing knight f6 and then c5. Quite a good idea for white when black plays a move like c5 very early, just to reinforce the pawn with c3. And now after knight c6, white sets up the stonewall formation with f4. The main characteristic of the stonewall is, firstly, that it's difficult for black to break down white's formation, and secondly, white is establishing strong control over the e5 square. It's very thematic for white to sink a knight into that square earlier rather than later. And the knight acts as a kind of linchpin behind which white starts the kingside attack. And this is what Frometa Castillo does in this game. She quickly plays her knight into e5. This in turn makes room for white's queen to come out to f3, which is a very good square as subsequently the queen may slide across the third rank to h3. In turn, monitoring h7. A very useful attacking idea to take on board. So already we see that Black has perhaps made two very small imprecisions. Number one, she set up a kind of inflexible formation. And number two, she's castled very early in the game. Now the Black player is graded 2100, which is about 180, 190 ECF. And this is a pretty strong player. And yet here she is, she's castled a little bit early, giving White the ideal opportunity to attack her king. Well, black took on d4, and white recaptured with the e-pawn. That's quite a good deal for white, as once again, it liberates the queen side. If there is a slight problem with the white formation, it's that the queen side pieces take some time to come out. When you play this formation with white, you've always got to be aware that your queen side pieces could be a potential problem for you. So have some good idea of what to do with them. I'm going to show you ways to get those pieces out uh, as we go through our selection. But for the time being, black was getting a bit intimidated by the knight on e5, tries to get rid of it with knight d7, and now white threatens immediate checkmate after queen h3. Please remember this manoeuvre, queen f3 to h3. It's very characteristic of this line. And now black plays pawn up to f5. Well, of course, when black plays a move like that, it tells me that... He's thinking about putting something on e4. But it does, doesn't fit in in this particular position with black's move knight d7. Black would much rather have the knight on f6 in this position, ready to jump into e4 immediately. But white takes advantage of the absence of the knight from f6 by pushing forward with g4. And you can see already white is building up a very strong attacking position. Black took the knight. Whilst that knight remains on e5, White is always going to have a very strong grip on proceedings. And after f takes e5, 
naturally, again, this makes White's task of bringing that bishop on c1 into the game easier. Black blocked with g6. But now there are a whole complex of weak dark squares around the black king, which hopefully White can exploit. Well, White played knight f3, and after queen d8, bishop h6. So ideal development for White. Now it's a question of how to take the attack further. Black moved the rook, and White castled on the queen side. Normally, in the Stonewall formation, you'd be expecting White to castle on the king side, but this game is rather unusual. Black has played the whole opening rather passively. She's made a few imprecisions, and White is able now to manoeuvre the pieces into perfect attacking positions. And White's already now threatening just to take on f5, winning a pawn. So, Black defends. White brings the knight into g5. Black plays queen to e7, not really knowing what to do. And now Fromita Castillo brings the rook from d1 to f1. And who could have guessed that White would have played so modestly in the opening few moves? Because she's built up this fantastic attacking formation. And Black is very passive. So Black continues to play solidly with knight d8, but no sign of activity. And White now starts to open up the game. Queen g2 makes room for the h-pawn to come into the game, and white could be thinking of using this pawn as a battering ram against the black king. Knight f7 on passant, white was attacking the pawn on d5, so here it is, a painless queen takes d5 move, pinning that knight on f7. This really is a horrible position for black now. She tries to bail out with bishop e6. White simply removes the bishop, and then moves her own bishop back to d2. So on top of an attack and an extra pawn, White's got this very strong bishop pair here and now threatens to take on f5 due to the pin on the pawn at g6. To her credit, Black mobilises her rooks now over the next couple of moves. But White's a solid pawn up. No need for any heroics in a position like this. You've just got to nail things down. Bishop c4 is a good way to start to do this. After rook c6... White played bishop takes e6, and the point of this was to get the queen's bishop into the game via e1. And now bishop h4 is a serious threat. Rook b6 was answered by queen c4, and rook c6 by queen to e2. Queen came up to e6, and now white got the h-pawn going. Noticeable feature of this position from where I'm sitting actually is the lack of black counterplay. Black has no real counterplay. She's just got to sit and watch as White continues to execute the attack. Rook a6, OK, there is one threat now. Queen takes a2 check. But White can easily block. And after knight d6, White played cutely here with d5. Black was basing her play on the pawn at e5 being pinned. White plays d5. Of course, if Black takes that with the Queen, the knight disappears. So Black's got to retreat. And now white plays c4. White's plan now to get that bishop on the long diagonal towards the black king. So what, black can stop that temporarily by playing knight e4. But queen b2 renews all the threats. And now e6 sets up a tremendous attack. Queen e5 with the threat of bishop c3. Rook f8 and now h5. The attack runs on oiled wheels. Queen g7. There are just too many black pieces on the long diagonal for my liking. H takes G6, stripping open lines. And now the scene is set for the final couple of moves. As white just pushes the pawns on. And black literally has no defence in this position. She decided to resign. Well that was a very good example of how white may, with the help of a couple of imprecisions from black, build up a very strong attack using the stonewall formation. Particularly noticeable were two things. Number one, the speed with white put the knight on e5. And number two, the manoeuvre queen f3 to h3. These two ideas are very thematic in the... ...project since inception. And now I'd like to present to you the unusual Blackmar Dima Gambit. On this video, we're going to cover almost uncharted territory in terms of theory. And I believe that at the end of it, you will have a new weapon in your chess playing arsenal. A weapon that can win you 
more games. It's actually quite rare in early 2014 that an almost completely new Gambit idea can be found because chess theory has developed at such a rate since the end of the Second World War that virtually every opening has been analysed extensively, including the Black Mardima Gambit. Yet, my research has proved that there are avenues within the Black Mardima for White to experiment to get off the beaten track and to cause Black real problems. So the subject of this short DVD is to focus on the very unusual Black Mardima Gambit that starts with the following moves. Now you'll recall that the Black Mardima is all about sacrificing a centre pawn. White tries to open up lines, develop very quickly and get on to the attack. There are various ways to reach the desired position, but usually after D takes E4, White now plays F3. However, on this DVD, I'm going to recommend that we take a close look at Bishop G5, a virtually unexplored alternative. You might call this the unknown Blackmar. Well, the point of this move is fairly clear. Again, White is concentrating on quick development. He hasn't committed himself with f3 though, yet. He may play f3, he may not. It all depends. But primarily, he's thinking about not only getting his pawn back, because bishop takes f6, gets the pawn back easily. Of course, you have to surrender the bishop pair when you do that. He's also thinking about casting queenside at the earliest possible opportunity. So you will see in this line, quite often, that white moves his queen, either to d2 or sometimes to e2, and then castles on the queenside. Queen e2 can be a very dangerous idea in this line, as it kind of ties down the bishop on c8. The queen on e2 not only threatens the pawn on e4, it's got possibilities on b5 as well. Queen to b5 check, should that bishop on c8 move. So already, I guarantee you, if you play this move, you're going to be setting 99% of your opponents almost unknown problems. And they might not be able to come to terms with the problems that you're setting. So just to begin with, and I think this DVD returns to the spirit of the early Foxy opening uh, videos. Trying to find unusual avenues, tricky avenues, with which you can surprise your opponent. To start off with then, we're going to take a look at a few miniatures where black goes down very quickly against this line. And it will just give you the impression of the sort of play white can generate from this position. Hello everyone and welcome to this two volume DVD series on the Collie system. Now the Collie system is a pretty solid looking idea but at the same time it's very aggressive too. I'm International Master Andrew Martin and I'm going to be your host on this tour of what is a most fascinating and useful opening. An opening that can rack up the points because I'm not so sure even after looking at very high class games that many black players are well prepared to meet it. They don't really think of the collie as a dangerous opening, so they don't study it carefully. And there are plenty of ways that white can spring a surprise. So join with me now and let us take our tour of what is a most fascinating opening. Hello everyone, I'm International Master and FIDE Senior Trainer Andrew Martin. And welcome to this DVD where I'm going to be recommending that the collie system is a good method of play for white. The DVD is split up into two parts, so to start off with, let's take a look at the contents list. Now, in the first DVD, the first part of the DVD, I'm going to be looking at the collie system proper, which starts after d4, d5, and now white plays knight f3. Note that I'm not going to consider other black moves after 1d4. 
otherwise the DVD might take up 24 hours or something like that. Instead, we just concentrate on the way to the collie system proper, which is with the characteristic move E3. Now this is uh, a quiet looking move, but the thing about the collie is it's a very deceptive system. White's position is often akin to a coiled spring. What looks passive suddenly jumps to life and White can often get a very strong attack using the collie method of play. And the collie system proper starts when Black plays E6. Now White puts his bishop on D3 and Black pushes up in the center with C5. Now once Black does that, you almost always reinforce the center by going C3. Again, we're not gonna consider the collie Zuckertort system where White plays B3 in this position. That's a completely different animal. Instead, I'm gonna stick with the collie proper. White plays C3. And now Black's gotta make a choice. What is he gonna do with his minor pieces? Will he bring the knight out on b8 to c6, or will it come to d7? Will the bishop on f8 come out to d6, or will it go to e7? These are the immediate choices that black has to face in this position. Just to take play on a little bit, let's just assume black plays knight c6, white castles, bishop e7. I mean, black can adopt other setups. Now, white puts his knight on d2, black castles. And the scene is set for some sort of line opening move by White, which is absolutely typical of the Collie. And the way White can do this is to take on C5 and then to push forward in the centre with the move E4. This unleashes the dynamic energy in White's position, or is supposed to, and can often, as I say, give him a kingside attack. Just dropping back a couple of moves to here. Of course there's no reason why white should take on c5 straight away. He might preface that with the move queen e2. An alert observer would have noticed in the previous position black could have exchanged off on e4 and maybe traded the queens. Well this way avoids the exchange of queens and if black say player moves like b6 then again white could consider taking on c5 and going e4. This is quite promising. Or he may think about the move e4 straight away. So this is the initial introduction to the collie system. This is what White's looking to do. Build up slowly, unleashes energy of the position with the idea of e4. So in the first part of this DVD, that's what we'll be considering. Now the second part, I go on to looking at alternatives for black. I mean, there's no reason why black should block in that bishop on c8 with e6. And this is a very important section of the DVD. Because what we're going to find is that if black plays moves like bishop f5, which is one of his best moves, or bishop g4, or c6, these are all good moves for black, then white has got to change his method of play. He can't just go routinely on with the collie setup, bishop d3, c3 knight d2 well of course he can but he doesn't emerge with any sort of advantage from the opening and generally against these setups which resemble the slav or maybe the baltic defense white does best to go c4 as early as possible so we'll be looking at that in the second half of this dvd and finally we'll take a look at g6 where black angles to go back into some sort of grimfeld position uh, again a perfectly respectable method of play and it's worth noting that a move like bishop d3, whenever black fianchellos the king bishop, is a uh, pretty useless move. That bishop on d3 is biting on granite. You know, it's hitting the pawn at g6. So again, against g6 systems, white's got to change his approach slightly. So that's what we're looking to do. And uh, we're going to kick off by examining the collie system proper. Now, of course, defensive technique has improved beyond recognition when we consider the games of 1930. But just to show you that the college system is still being used successfully today with the same ideas, I've got a game for you from the Belgian team championship played in 2016 between Tom Pichot, grade 2363, and Chemal Gulbas, grade 2360. 
So these are players approaching international master standard, if they're not IMs already. And uh, it's interesting to see that White wins a very nice game using the Collie system against a modern player. So we get the setup where Black plays c5, walks straight into the Collie, and Gorbass decides to set up by putting his knight on c6 and then his bishop on d6. As I say, this layout from Black is quite important, and the knight on c6 is slightly more actively placed than it is on d7. But of course, a bit later on, when Black plays b6 and bishop b7, as he usually does, uh, the knight could be blocking the bishop. There are pros and cons to each of these minor piece developments by Black. Anyway, White just gets on with the system. He plays his knight to d2, and now he decides to take on c5 straight away and play e4. 